On the internet, it seems anything goes. Say what you want. Post your thoughts. It's information anarchy. No holds barred. Or at least that's the way things started out in the early 1990s, until all of us realized that freedom of expression on the internet offers some challenges. What if a person or group's free expression on the internet threatens the very existence of a government or insults a cultural group? What if it is used to support terror or crime? What if one person's free expression in a blog posting damages another person's reputation or violates someone's privacy? I have seen government uh, being sensitive to a possibility that I'll blog about something. Uh, that has given me tremendous power, which I have to use responsibly. And if your idea of freedom of expression includes sharing my creative works, my photos, original writing, or music, doesn't that violate my property rights? The ideals of free expression online collide with the concepts of privacy and intellectual property rights. Finding the right way to deal with this grouping of internet issues, called openness, is just one of the important tasks of the people meeting here at the Internet Governance Forum in Rio de Janeiro. Where people from civil society, business, government, and non-governmental organizations can learn from one another, make global connections, and share information that will shape the way the internet develops in the coming years. It's not something that you can really control in some sense. It's not like a telephone system which is hierarchy, where I can monitor everything here at the top. It's something where, which is very, very, it was designed to survive a nuclear attack. If it was designed to survive a nuclear attack, it can survive censorship. Most internet censorship takes place behind the scenes in non-democratic nations and does not generally get public notice. But a recent example of public censorship ensued when an anonymous person posted a 44-second mocking video clip about Thailand's King Pumipan on YouTube. The video showed a caricature of the king with an image of feet near his head, a highly insulting portrayal in Thai culture. The Thai government's response was to block all of YouTube for all users in the country. After five months of negotiations, YouTube agreed to block access to the offending video clip only for users in Thailand. Did YouTube make the right call? Is it YouTube's responsibility? Is it any internet site content provider's responsibility to censor its content in an effort to respect the individual wishes of all people in all cultures? How can that be accomplished while still allowing people free expression? I don't believe it should be the role of internet service providers, if I understand you correctly, to self-censor and to eliminate things from their services which might somehow be deemed to be insulting to certain cultures. I think that that also would pose a threat to the openness of the, the internet. Stakes for free speech were significantly higher this fall with the violence in Myanmar where the military government attempted to shut down internet communication in the face of insurrection by people who were rising up against 45 years of oppression. Most media organizations had been kicked out of the country, but citizens used the internet to share news of the massive protests and the military junta's deadly retaliation. At least 10 people were killed, likely many more, and thousands were injured or arrested. The government in Myanmar cut off internet access, cut off phone landlines, and tried to confiscate mobile phones but satellite connections were harder to block. Students used hidden cell phones to send out text messages and blogs to the outside world. Memory cards with photos and videos were smuggled out of the country. And the government found that stopping the flow of information is nearly impossible, as scenes of monks in the streets in chaos and violence made their way to the world's news media, and UN officials demanded a meeting to try to resolve the conflict. By most Western standards, it's easy to criticize the system in China, where 30,000 internet police monitor citizens' internet use and have blocked many forums and websites from being accessed from computers inside the country. If you want to get online in China, be prepared to check in with the government, register to get your internet use permit, and understand they'll be watching where you go, what you look at, and what you say online. This seems heavy-handed to people with democratic sensibilities, but the government in China argues that it is protecting people from all sorts of dangers, pornography, criminal activity, scams, misinformation, and threats to society. They say the government is just doing its job. Are you going to tolerate the freedom of the use of the internet for pornography for our kids? Or safety? Or spasm or whatever? There, such, there should be, as I understand. You know, freedom, yes. but also certain regulatory means. 
Governments and corporations also propose that filtering the Internet and even setting it up in separately priced tiers will allow them to smooth the flow of online traffic, provide the finances to make the Internet faster and better, and establish appropriate control of intellectual property. Citizens are inclined to agree to accept some formalized structures when they are told that their own monetary gain, children, privacy, or safety are at risk. But the very structures that would allow governments and corporations such control over privacy and content can be used to stop free expression and cut off the flow of information needed to build a more open world. And how can anyone establish rules on these issues that make sense across national boundaries? There is always a problem when something becomes uh, internationalized in the sense of you want to come up with a, a rule, a policy, uh, something that is blanket. This is why I think, the, personally, I believe even ICANN is the whole idea of starting IGF because as well there is one body that handles the whole of the internet and it's called the final power. When people at the Internet Governance Forum discuss openness, they are also discussing the protection of privacy and its relation to free expression, the relationship of national regulations of free expression and the border free internet, citizens' rights to be creative and share information and how those rights relate to the rights of intellectual property owners, and open source software and standards. Forcing Western practices and laws into countries with a different view of internet openness could lead to a fragmented future in which some governments decide to opt out of the internet and create their own walled gardens with laws and practices consistent with their beliefs. Through discussions such as these at IGF, the world is trying to find ways to maintain a borderless internet that adequately balances the rights of the individual with the rule of law and the interest of our nations. From Rio de Janeiro, I'm Michelle Hammerbacker for Imagining the Internet and Elon University's School of Communications.